So hello, everybody. First of all, Happy New Year to everybody, to all IoT uh, fans and nerds around the world. I wish us all exactly 12 good seminars this year. So every month we will have an exciting talk from somebody and I wish they will all go very smoothly and they will be highly interesting. So my name is Anna Fürst. I'm one of the organizers of this seminar, as most of you might probably already know. And today we have Dirk Pesch, Professor Dirk Pesch from University College in Cork. And he will be giving us a very nice overview of what is actually LoRa and going a little bit more deeply into the technical details of LoRa and how we can evaluate it and how we can actually improve it because we all know that LoRa is great, but it has also some weaknesses. So Dirk, welcome and Happy New Year. You're welcome. You. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Anna, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everybody. So, uh, so today I'm going to talk, uh, as Anna said, about uh, some aspects of uh, of LoRa. So, LoRa for uh, the Internet of Things. Um, and uh, I'd like to start a little bit looking at connectivity options for the Internet of Things. Then, talk a little bit about LoRa. An introduction. Some of you might might know that already. Some of you might not. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about um, aspects around scalability, resource management uh, for LoRa. We've done some work on LoRa and satellite communications. And then if we have time, we can also look a little bit at, um, at how can we actually get LoRa to, to work with the internet uh, directly. So if we look at connectivity options for the IoT, there is a wide range of wireless um, unlicensed band connectivity solutions for machine to machine communication for the Internet of Things available. And it's kind of, it's almost like a zoo. And you see here on the left, I've given you some examples here of wide area ones and short range ones that might be used in buildings uh, or smart homes, for example. Um, and they all have different characteristics that are characterized, that, that are ex expressed through range, for example, the throughput that they have, the power consumption, and so on. And if we look at the, the dominant unlicensed spectrum technologies, there is the uh, IEEE 802.15.4 uh, compliant ones. Uh, sometimes, you know, they, they, they come in disguises such as Thread, Zigbee. Um, more, most recently, the new MATA standard builds on top of this, for example. Um, then there is different versions of Wi-Fi, which is not quite so power efficient, but lots of smart home technology relies on it. And then we have the low power wide area network solutions, for example, of which um, of which LoRa uh, is one of them. And LoRa uh, is one of the, the technologies that is uh, operates an unlicensed spectrum, which means that everybody can use it. Uh, however, there are, because it's unlicensed spectrum, there's a particular etiquette there in terms of uh, re regulation uh, in in regard to power consumption, um, duty cycle, etc., and we'll come. We'll talk about that in a moment. So, if we look at LoRa, it's an open standard. Um, apart from the physical layer perspective, uh, where the physical layer is owned by one company, uh, Semtex, uh, they own the IP for this, and they uh, make most of the chipsets for it. There is some other uh, companies that make chipsets and license um, from Semtex, um, but. Uh, the the network architecture, the most of the software infrastructure, etc., is all uh, based on an open standard and lots of open source software. And uh, because of that, they're not only public network deployments like the Things Network, for example, which you may know, but also private deployments. And you can build your own LoRa network if you want to. And lots of organizations have done that. LoRa is characterized by particular end devices, then the base stations are called gateways. These are concentrators. So it is a simple cellular topology, similar to cellular networks the, the, that we use with our smartphones, for example. Then there is a network server, which controls uh, the, the radio access. And then there is a back end system uh, of application servers. And typically, the network server and the application servers, like in the case of the Things Network, are owned by the Things Network, whereas the gateways and so on can often be contributed by, by end users themselves. Um, the, the medium access control protocol is a LOA based, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And there is a number of different classes uh, for different downlink profiles. And LoRa also offers end-to-end -end security, which is, is pretty good for an open standard. So if we look at the, the different aspects here in, in terms of the protocol stack, so there's a number of 
frequency bands allocated. So in Europe, it's the 868 band, and there is also now the 2.4 gigahertz band available. Um, there's also the 433 megahertz band, which is even, even lower um, um, frequency, which means typically longer range. And then in, uh, in the US, it's 915 megahertz. So these are the, the unlicensed spectrum. And so that kind of uh, actually makes it quite hard sometimes for, uh, for LoRa to interoperate uh, globally because devices that work in Europe may not always work out of the box in the US or in Japan or Asia, for example, where the frequency ranges are located are different. The physical layer then, as I mentioned, owned by Semtech, um, a, um, a US-based company that own the IP. And then the LoRa Alliance specifies the, um, uh, the, what is called the LoRa Wide Area Network, which uh, is the MAC uh, protocol in particular, the encryption aspects and so on, a few, few of those topics. And they have to find three types of classes, class A, B, and C. Um, most of our work has focused on class A, although we have also looked in terms of um, over the air updates of software for end devices, for example, at class B and C. I won't be talking about that today because um, I, that, that would <laughs> go beyond the, the allocated time. And then on top of that are applications that are user defined. So LoRa, the LoRa physical layer is based on chirp spread spectrum technology. So this is kind of um, a tone based spread spectrum technology. So it's uh, the, the uh, over uh, a bit period, the tone uh, or the frequency increases. So it's like the, so this kind of uh, approach here. Um, so it's a random change in, in the tone, the frequency during the transmission, and it offers different spreading factors. So the way the tone changes and the, uh, the, the frequency changes leads to different uh, spreading factors and the spreading factors then um, are the chip rate divided by the symbol rate. So the actual chip rate is equal to two to the power of the spreading factor times the, 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 the bit rate. Um, this leads to different amounts of payload available. Um, and the worst case payload is 59 bytes, which sort of indicates to you the kind of applications that you can have here. So you can't have video transmission over LoRa, for example, because the data rate isn't there. But 59 bytes is for many applications, uh, many kind of sensing wireless sensor network applications is actually is actually sufficient. So, and these are the kind of applications, low data rate, less frequent transmissions and so on at which LoRa is geared. Um, another aspect, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a etiquette there because it's unlicensed spectrum, so it, everybody can use it. Um, there's a duty cycle limitation of 1%, which means that only 1% of the time a device can transmit, which applies to end devices, but it also applies uh, to the gateways. So, um, and that is, that's a particular issue, and we'll come back to that when I'll uh, talk a little bit about some of the improvements that we've proposed through our research. Uh, this is the equation for that, uh, uh, that, that expresses the chip waveform. I, I won't go into any further detail on that, but if you're interested, you can, you know, there's plenty of publications there that, uh, that you, can, you, you can read to, to learn more about it. Um, Okay, different spreading factors are expressed through um, give different different symbol lengths and so on. And again, I won't won't go too much into detail here. Uh, this is kind of more the, the the communication technology, the underlying communication technology of LoRa. And again, you you know, if you're interested in this, there's there's plenty that you can read up on. Now, <clears throat> because we have different spreading factors, we have, as I mentioned, that leads to different types of um, different types of bit rates available to the end user. So if we look at, uh, so LoRa defines a different uh, data rate uh, profiles. So from zero to, to seven are defined in the standard. And so zero is a spreading factor of 12 in 125 kilohertz channels. So the standard, the standard uh, radio channel is for LoRa is 125 kilohertz, although 250 and 500 kilohertz are defined by the standard, but they are, typically not used. So if you use a, uh, the Things Network, for example, and so on, that tends to be in 125 kilohertz channels. And then spraying factors are defined uh, from 6 to 12, but in operation, they typically are from 7 to 12. And you can see here the data rates that are uh, correspond to a particular spreading factor 
um, and, and a particular bandwidth, channel bandwidth. So you can see is if you have spreading factor 12 and 125 kilohertz channels, you actually have only 250 bits uh, that you uh, that that you, you you get to transmit in in one LoRa frame. Then LoRa can different use different power levels, um, so that uh, then also impacts the range over which you can transmit. But it also impacts the interference, for example, that is being caused, um, and so on. And we'll come back to that. How we how we trying how we've done we've done some work on trying to optimize spreading factor allocation power management, et cetera, and uh, to look at the performance um, that that yields for the network. So here we can see different power, discrete power values. So we don't have a, the ability in LoRa to have continuous power um, tr um, a power value allocation. So, so you can see that you it ranges from 20 dBm down to 2 dBm. And then we also, uh, LoRa also defines for different spreading factors, different coding rates. So this is a coding rate four over, between four over five to four over eight. So this is forward error correction that um, protects the transmission. But all of this, the, the, the spreading factor allocation, the bit rates, et cetera, um, um, lead to different types of receiver sensitivity. So you can see is the higher the spreading factor, the, 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 the more sensitive the receiver, which means that at a spreading, a spreading factor of 12, um, the receiver can still receive a transmission at, uh, at, uh, at a received power level of minus 137 dBm. So, that, um, so that's, um, uh, that, that means we can transmit over a long range, but that comes at the cost of a lower data rate. So if we want to increase the data rate, we have to reduce the spreading factor, and that means we reduce the sensitivity, and that typically results in a reduction of the of the range over which we can transmit, for example. So these are all important aspects, important um, um, aspects in uh, when we want to use LoRa and build a LoRa network, for example, that we have to be conscious of this. But these are also aspects we can play around in order to optimize the performance of a LoRa network. And I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in, in, in a moment. So the other aspect uh, with the increase in bit rate also, and the uh, we 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 also trade energy and the time on air. So the uh, so the higher the spreading factor, the more time you are on air because it takes longer now to transmit um, a particular amount of bits, and that means that the longer we transmit, the more energy we use. However, we will also see in a moment the longer we are on air, the more we prevent others from transmitting successfully because if we occupy the channel, then others cannot transmit unless we, we you know, uh, if they don't want to cause interference, for example, and that has an impact on capacity. So uh, in, this, uh, in, this, as in this context here, there is the adaptive data rate is um, defined, which needs to be managed in an optimum way in terms of power spreading factor, coding rate, and so on. And that also has an impact, as I mentioned, the longer the on-air time, the more energy is consumed, and there, therefore the, the lower the lifetime of battery power devices. So these are all important co uh, concepts that, that we need to be aware of when we want to use LoRa in an IoT application in order to optimize the performance of our, our, uh, our network. So if we look at this here again, we can see the spreading factor here on the on-air time uh, uh, based on the different bandwidths. So as I said, the standard bandwidth is 125 kilohertz. So this is the blue curve here. And we can see the spreading factor increases from 7 to 12. The air time increases very substantially um, uh, in terms of transmitting uh, a particular LoRa frame, for example. Now, if we have a wider bandwidth uh, channel, then that uh, the, the airtime is reduced. And here we can also see the energy consumption increases. Again, the higher the spreading factor, the higher the, the, the energy consumption because we are more on air. However, if we ha have a higher spreading factor, as I said earlier, we, have, um, um, we can transmit over, over a longer range, for example, and so on. So that's an advantage. So not all is a disadvantage, um, but again, we have to tr we have to make choices in this case here, yeah, and I'll I'll explain how we did that in a moment. Okay, so that's the physical layer. Um, as I mentioned, uh, LoRa uses a very simple Aloha protocol um, in order to transmit a frame. So if we look here at a LoRa frame, there's a preamble here which is used for uh, synchronization because. Uh, the Aloha protocol is asynchronous, so the gateways listen all the time, and when the end devices want to transmit some data, they just 
turn on the power amplifier, they transmit the frame and so on. So the preamble is used to to synchronize uh, to the the, the allow the gateway to synchronize to the, the device's transmission. Then we have some headers, some CRC check here and so on. Uh, the header is uh, uses a coding rate of four over eight. And then for the payload and the payload CRC, we can define the coding rate between four over five to four over eight. And again, the whole lot is um, uh, covered by a particular spreading factor. And so the usually the way this works is there is a transmission uh, which is the time on air, then there's a receive delay. So if we have confirmable transmission, then the gateway will confirm whether it uh, received the transmission correctly or not. And there's two tr um, confirming uh, or receive windows that are being used here, which is receive window one and two. And depending on whether we have confirmable or non-confirmable transmission, this receive window isn't used all the time. Uh, however, it is used every so often because it allows the network to change some of the transmission parameters in the end devices. So that allows us to control how end devices, for example, use particular spreading factors, particular coding rates, and so on. So that, that gives us an, uh, the ability to, uh, during network operation, to optimize the network performance as well. And so those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, the ALOA protocol, it's a very old protocol developed in the late 1960s and the early days of, uh, of wireless transmissions, um, what did wireless packet radio transmissions, um, and it has um, a, a fairly poor performance in terms of the maximum throughput. Um, you know, this is slide I often use in lectures to explain how to calculate this. I I won't I won't do that today, but what it may basically means is that the the maximum throughput of a LOA is quite limited, and so so that means that a lot of transmissions are potentially wasted, and that means a lot of energy is wasted, a lot of retransmissions have to happen, or we lose out on particular sensing information if we don't retransmit, for example. So all of these things are important to understand when you want to design your your LoRa network and and design your LoRa application as well. So if we look at the LoRa Mac performance is um, um, there, there is a number of different aspects. So as I mentioned, the uh, depending on the the spreading factor, uh, there is a uh, the the on air time of a transmission varies. So for spreading factor seven, it's low. For spreading factor twelve, spreading factor twelve, it's high. And that means the longer a device is on air, the higher the probability that another device who would, which wants to transmit data might transmit during an ongoing transmission. And if that happens, then that can cause what is called a collision um, due to interference. And that means that both transmissions very often. Um, have errors in them, and they, and, and that means that the, the the receiving end cannot correctly decode them or cannot use the the transmitted information because it's incorrect. So, so that's a big issue. So, what we need to make sure is that we use the that we are aware of when we use a particular spreading factor, and that we do this very carefully. Another aspect that happens in in in, in packet radio transmissions is the so-called capture effect. So that means that. Um, a device that's very far away uh, that transmits around the same time as a device that's much closer might lose out in the transmission here. So while the so the 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 power level at which the the device that is close by is received is often much higher than the the transmission from a far away device. And so the the so-called signal to interference ratio in this case is often large enough for the gateway to receive the transmission from the close by device. So that means that's called the capture effect and the stronger one wins here, which means that devices who are far away from the gateway, for example, are disadvantaged in transmissions because they lose out in this capture effect very often. And that makes LoRa, the LoRa Mac protocol quite unfair. So this so-called near far problem is a big impact on fairness. And so what we did is we looked at ways of making LoRa a bit, bit fairer and by doing so, uh, making it perform better and also more energy efficient. And we'll look at that in a, in a moment. OK, so one of the things that you might be interested in is what we did. One of the pieces of work we did and we published um, a couple of years ago um, was looking at LoRa in terms of different IoT applications, the performance. So we looked at um, smart city type applications, so smart metering, for example, smart lighting, smart parking, fleet tracking, and so on. And so what we did is we created in a simulation environment lots and lots of end devices with 
a different, uh, you know, end devices that belong to one of these four types of applications. And then we had a, an urban environment where we had lots and lots of these devices that, that, um, that were um, running these applications. And so what we then did is we looked at the performance of these different IoT applications um, uh, in simulation. We used the LoRa sim, uh, simulator, which is an open source one that's quite well known. It was developed originally by uh, Martin Bohr and uh, Utz Rödig at Lancaster University. Utz is now a colleague in Cork. Um, so we, we, we continue to, to, to collaborate around these kind of um, these kind of pieces of work. Um, application payload was set to 20 bytes here because that's we deemed that to be sufficient for these kind of applications. And we ran the simulations in a kind of simulated kind of a months or months of real time applic uh, real time work. And we varied the number of nodes and we looked at different combinations of these um, parameters that I mentioned: the spreading factor, the bandwidth, the coding rate, and so on. So looking at spreading factor 12, spreading factor. Six, for example, which is, is, is one that's not typically used, but it's similar to seven and so on. So these are different types of combinations. And we looked at, at them and in order to see what was the performance of, um, of these kind of applications in urban environments. And so if we look at this here, then smart metering, for example, if we look at these different types of, uh, of parameter combinations, we can see that some of them, if we look at the the number of nodes here in terms of scalability, if we increase the number of nodes, what was the packet uh, delivery ratio? So the number of transmissions that were received correctly. And as you can see is here, if you increase the number of, um, the number of, uh, of nodes, then depending on the different combinations of, uh, of parameters, of configuration parameters for LoRa, you, you can see sometimes the, the, you know, depending on which one you use, sometimes the, the the, the performance is very good, and sometimes it actually drops. The packet delivery ratio drops to sort of below 60% in this case here when the number of nodes increases. So that doesn't make LoRa very scalable unless we are happy that only half of the transmissions actually are received. And so if we look at different applications, you can see different impact on um, uh, of the different applications on the scalability. And then we looked at the total energy consumption here, and you can see that depending on how you pick your configuration, you, so, you, you either, uh, you, you know, sometimes you use a lot of energy for very poor performance, and sometimes you actually have a really good performance and you actually don't need very much energy. So that shows you how important it is to pick these parameter combinations very carefully when you design your, your, your LoRa uh, wide area network application. I fully agree actually with that. Can you maybe come back? Like uh, my, my, my first question will be here. Um, how, how do you identify those parameter sets? Is just a trial and error or is there a more structured approach? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. So in this case here, we 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 just picked, we worked on the basis of uh, of earlier publications we had, which had proposed these parameter uh, combinations, for example, and we just evaluated them. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'll come now to in in a moment. I'll talk about the work we've done on the fairness, where we actually have to find an optimization strategy mm -hmm. to identify the right combinations for fairness, for example. But you could um, you could. Um, take a similar approach to find an optimization approach where you pick these different um, parameters as the variables and try to identify uh, what's the best combination of these these uh, or the best values for each of these parameters in order to get a particular performance, for example. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so it is, so there is, unfortunately, certainly I'm not aware of it, whether there is a real tool, whether like the likes of the Things Network or anybody there has a, a tool which gives you some guidance here. Uh, mm. There's lots of publications that have looked at this, which if you read them, you get a good insight into it. And you could certainly from that develop your own. But I'm not sure whether there actually is a real tool there that helps you with this. Yeah, it's a it's, it's a big problem, not only for Laura, but for pretty much everything in IoT. Yeah. Parameters over yes. parameters. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and this is something where... Where maybe if you know we you know if, if you have some expertise in this space then maybe that's good good to have because because you might be in demand. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll I'll skip this a little bit here. This wasn't so um, so important. Uh, I might skip this as well. So what we did here is, as I said earlier, 
um, the, the issue, if you look at this here, the issue is scalability. And part of that is, uh, is the increased collisions that you get when you increase the number of nodes. So the more nodes you have, the more nodes will transmit and the higher the probability of a collision. And that's because um, of the ALOA protocol, which doesn't have any coordination between nodes. So what we try to do is something very simple here. We try to kind of create a, a, a delay. And the kind of delay that you pick is based on your node ID, for example. So in a way, it's kind of a, a, a way of trying to tell nodes when within a particular um, within a particular uh, time frame they can transmit based on on their node ID, and that's based on the interarrival time uh, of uh, of data. Uh, if you have uh, periodic applications, for example, where you transmit, say, some meter reading, or you transmit, um, you transmit some temperature, temperature value, something like that, uh, where you have um, periodic transmissions, you can use that to spread out your transmissions between, um, you know, these periodic updates of sensor readings. And if everybody tries to comply to a different, to, to a similar, a similar policy here, in this way, we define this policy here through this red equation, um, you can actually improve the, um, the performance by reducing those collisions that occur when you're completely asynchronous, for example. Um, and so we looked at that and we, 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 we found uh, there was quite significant enhanced performance. I don't want to go through all of this detail here, but you know, you're very, anybody very welcome to look at our paper there in this case. Okay, so that that's, was one of the things where we looked at this. Now, the next piece of work that, uh, that the, the earlier work I did together with a former postdoc of mine, and, the, and then I did some work together with a PhD student looking at improving LoRaWAN fairness. Um, and so uh, here the, the, the issue is, as I mentioned earlier, this sort of near far problem where the nodes that are further away are disadvantaged because of the capture effect, for example. So, so um, they should actually transmit with a higher power in order to, uh, for the gateway to receive their transmission at a similar power level. Uh, as those that are closer by. So the idea would be that the, the nodes that are further away should transmit with a higher power and those that are close by should transmit with a lower power. So that this kind of dynamic power allocation is not something that works very well or that is not, not inherent in LoRa. Other, uh, other cellular technologies, for example, have that built in because the, the fairness issue is, is a well-known problem. So what we did here is we tried to uh, as I mentioned earlier, try to define an, an optimization problem here that in, that tries to uh, optimize different parameter settings in terms of the spreading factor, in terms of the the power setting, and so on to to increase fairness. And so we captured that in an in an um, optimization problem here that's delivered here. I don't want to go into too much detail, um, but effectively the idea here was that if you look at the uh, if you look at the collision probability, as I said earlier, of the blue ones here show with increasing spreading factor, the collision probability increases because the on-air time increases. What we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that devices on different spreading factors and different distances um, from the gateway were experiencing a similar um, um, data, a, a, sim a similar uh, collision probability so that uh, that there was an, uh, a much more much more fair or much fairer performance um, across the different uh, parameter settings that we could have in LoRa. So uh, we looked at Jane's uh, fairness index here. So um, basically what we wanted to achieve is we want to achieve a, a fairness of one, which means that everybody is treated fairly uh, when the number of nodes increases. And with um, a fair uh, data rate, we should achieve this with an equal data rate, for example, um, we, we may not achieve the fairness when the nodes increase, as we've seen before, we get increased collisions and so on, and that makes it actually quite unfair. So, so what, uh, uh, sorry, what is quite interesting actually in the slide before in the, in the collision probability is that it seems like also the average collision probability has decreased. Is that just a, is it? The, the average provision, uh, well, yeah, I mean, the, the collision probability uh, 
basically the the idea is that the the fairness leads also to a reduced collision probability yeah cool okay yeah so that's and and i have some more graphs to that i can show you some some more in a moment uh, so okay. if you bear with me we'll we'll get there i do um so basically what we wanted to do is we wanted to balance the received signal strength within a safe margin to overcome the the near fire effect here and so to increase the, 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 the nodes that are far away, to increase their chances that their packets are received. The impact of the capture effect uh, cannot be entirely eliminated because, as I mentioned earlier, LoRa doesn't use uh, continuous power levels. It doesn't allow continuous power levels. It has discrete power levels between 2 and 14 dBm, typically. And so that, that doesn't, doesn't give us uh, complete fairness. But if you look at this here, for example, the distance, so what, what, what you have is you have, because of path loss, you have a fall in, in received power over distance. So if the distance increases, then the maximum received signal strength drops depending on which power level you use, 14 or 2. So if you use 14, which is um, the highest, 14 dBm, uh, then, of course, you receive even at a larger distance with a, a better received indicator. But what we wanted to do here is we wanted to basically balance this out so that everybody uh, receives roughly with the same power at, uh, at uh, independent of distance almost. Now, when you're very close to the, the base station in this gray zone here or the gateway, then um, the, this region will always have a better probability of reception and there is very little you can do, but that's very close by. Um, however, so what we did was, Again, we used uh, a computer simulation to do this, um, and we looked at the fairness and compared this with two pieces from the literature. Again, uh, Martin Bohr and Utz Rödig's work um, in 2017, and then work by um, folks from, um, is this Sarah Polin? I, I can't remember. I think this is Keo Leuven work here. Um, and so we compared this. So if you look at the fairness index here, um, our approach basically offers the best fairness. Now, what our aim was, of course, to have a fairness of one, uh, even if we increase the number of nodes. But as I mentioned earlier, that's it's, it's not really possible because of the um, because of the um, that the inherent limitations on what the capacity is of the channel, but also in in terms of the discrete power values that we have. As you can see, is here we our approach achieves better fairness compared to. Uh, the work by by Polin and others, and certainly definitely much better than uh, one of these uh, um, combinations or parameter combinations. In this case, five. This is the same combination that I mentioned earlier of the earlier work by by Martin Bohr and others. Um, so we achieve an improvement over the state of the art here by you know sometimes very significant improvement in terms of fairness, sometimes not so much. However. But we achieve in a fairness improvement uh, while the data extraction rate, which is the rate at which we uh, extract the data correctly or the packet delivery ratio sometimes used synonymously here, um, is there's no sacrifice. So we, we, we make it much fairer, but we still get the same performance in terms of received, correctly received packets. But the other effect also is we... Um, we receive an improvement also in terms of the uh, the the energy consumption. So we have um, while we have um, um, while our energy consumption is not quite as good as the work uh, by Martin Martin Bohr's work here, which is green. Um, we are better than the the work that's equally fair. Uh, if we look at this here, is equally fair. But of course, we are much better in terms of the um, the, the actually correct receptions. So by, by, by making it fairer for all the nodes, uh, by optimizing these parameter settings on a per node basis in order to make it really fair, we are fairer for nodes. We don't sacrifice in, in terms of reliability, but we also improve in terms of, um, of energy efficiency. So that's kind of the message that I have here. Um, Okay, so that's uh, the aspect of fairness. But uh, as I said, is some of these issues are really caused by the um, by the Aloha Mac, which is very simple. It doesn't require time synchronization. Um, uh, it, uh, but it it limits the scalability, and because of collisions, 
uh, uh, and so on. Um, and so in order to enhance that, you know, kind of in the in in uh, at the time when the Aloha protocol was developed, uh, these kind of limitations, the original inventors realized that, and they introduced lots of different ways of going about it. And so one of the the ways of of addressing this that that was developed in the early 1970s, for example, was a time slotted approach, and then a reservation approaches came along, and so on. And so a lot of this stuff is still used, very much used today, in 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 uh, in many other um, mobile radio communication systems. So what we said is, okay, um, so what if we introduce time slotted operation here to uh, to overcome some of the issues of the 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 asynchronous operation that is uh, of Aloha and and the impact of this. Now the 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 disadvantage of course is that with time slotted operation you need synchronization, and synchronization means you have to. Uh, update the, or you have to resynchronize every so often because of because of clock drifts in 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 those devices and so on and so this has to be carefully constructed uh, so that you don't actually use more energy uh, at the end of the of the end of the day so that you you um, that, that you might get better performance but then you the lifetime of your nodes is significantly reduced and so so we wanted to to investigate that and try to find ways where we balance this very carefully. And the motivation was twofold. One thing what we wanted to do is investigate, could we, could we do this uh, when we have needs for bulk data delivery, for example, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And the other one was um, if we wanted to LoRa in sort of more industrial type applications where you have to have a limited delay uh, or delay limits um, uh, in terms of your transmissions where you can't just wait for uh, ever until you eventually get the transmission, but where it has to come within delay bounds. So if we look at the bulk data transfer, this is a very nice piece of work that my former PhD student Khaled um, did. And so the idea here is we might have a LoRa deployment in a remote region, for example, where we don't have, uh, because it's remote, where we might not have a gateway close by in, 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 in range, for example, um, or we could deploy a gateway but the gateway then uh, doesn't have a backend connection. So, so in this case, um, you know, we we envisage that we might have this remote deployment, and every so often we may have um, we may have a drone flying by, for example, that collects the data from the sensors in bulk. So the drone might fly by once a day and tries to uh, collect the data as fast as possible. Of course, the, as you as you may know, drones have limited limited range. They are battery powered, so they you know, often drones may only be able to fly for half an hour to an hour or something. And so within that time frame, you have to give all the nodes a chance to upload their data into the into the drone. Uh, and then the drone takes this with them. And so that means that if you have, if all the nodes transmit at the same time, you get lots of collisions and so on, and you get the sense that that's not very effective. So you have to coordinate the transmissions very carefully. And so that was part of the work here. So how can we define um, a, an enhancement of the MAC protocol that allows for this bulk transmission. Um, and so again, the resource, the, the things that we can play around with here are the data rates, the channels, the transmission power we have, and so on. So all of these aspects that I mentioned earlier. So what we did was we, we looked at using a time-slotted approach. So managing transmissions in slots to mitigate collisions. So, um, so we give every we reserve a particular slot for a particular node uh, so they can transmit and they won't be interfered with by transmission from another node. Um, what we can play with here, we have six parallel data collection um, streams, if you want to, one per spreading factor, because the spreading factors create quasi-orthogonal um, uh, channels in which the, the nodes can transmit. Um, However, we have a problem with, with LoRa, as I mentioned earlier, is because we use unlicensed spectrum, we have this duty cycle limitation. So we can only transmit at 1% of the time. So we need to make sure that the design that we have in the transmission scheduling and so on obeys the duties, the 1% duty cycle limitation. And also what we want is when we, when we have this bulk transfer, uh, you know, the drone flies by, we want to make sure that we actually receive the data correctly so that not the drone flies by and then comes back and half the data is missing because the transmission wasn't correct. So we want acknowledgements. But here, 
because the drone as the gateway obey needs to obey the one percent duty cycle as well. We wanted to, uh, we 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 are looking at group acknowledgements in order to uh, optimize the duty cycle. So we have a number of publications here that if you want to learn about this in in greater detail, I I refer you back to them. But I'll summarize a little bit of how we did this. So the idea is we have multiple uh, uh, spreading factors and we have then a particular frame length. As you can see here, is the frame length increases with spreading factor because with increased spreading factor, as I mentioned earlier, the on-air time increases. So the frame gets longer and we need to make sure that all of that fits into, into a, a periodic cycle where we give every node a chance to transmit as much as possible in order to upload the data in bulk. And so here the question then is, when a node um, joins the, the bulk transmission, then we have to decide which spreading factor should they use, on which slot should they transmit, and so on. And we wanted to have um, uh, the ability to optimize for energy consumption and also optimize for collection time. So if you have nodes that need to live for a very long period of time on their battery, you might, um, uh, and you and the drone, maybe the, the, the drone has enough power, the collection time could be longer, for example. Um, um, or the collection time might not need to be optimized, but we want to optimize for node energy, for example. Or if there's lots of nodes and the drone doesn't have as much battery, for example, and the drone cannot stay very long there, then we may have to optimize for data collection time. So that's kind of the, the different parameters that we invented. And then we we... We, we have two phases. We have a, a, a joining phase where each uh, node joins a, a, the bulk data transmission um, pros, uh, process. And then we have a second stage where we basically give each node where we transmit the particular settings in terms of spreading factor power, uh, transmission power, um, time slot, etc. During the first, the joining phase, for example, we achieve a time synchronization of about one second resolution, which isn't, isn't enough. However, in the second one, where we disseminate the frame structure, so the packet lengths, the number of slots per frame, the guard times, and so on, um, in this year, we then can achieve a fine time synchronization down to one milliseconds, which is, is enough uh, for nodes uh, to, with a particular 10 millisecond guard period before and after the transmission, to uh, to avoid interference when they transmit in a particular slot. And so when we look at this year, look at the performance of this year, so we looked at legacy LoRa transmission, we looked at this kind of delayed LoRa one transmission that I mentioned earlier, which we had looked at in the smart city application. And then we use our approach, which we called free, um, uh, either optimized for energy or optimized for collection time. And as you can see is here, if we have an application that uh, generates 20 bytes every five minutes, requires confirmable transmissions to say, I got this, uh, I posit acknowledgements that the transmission was correct, and so on. And data collection is once per day, then we have about 5.6 kilobytes per node um, per collection. So if we look at this here, if we use this, the legacy LoRa one, as you can see is here, the number of devices increases, the network energy consumption increases because the the, the, we get lots and lots of collisions, the nodes have to retransmit and so on. However, if we, uh, if we use the delayed approach, it's um, where we use kind of this sort of quasi self-organizing slotting, the energy consumption is much reduced because we get less collisions. But if we plan this properly, then we get really good performance in terms of energy consumption um, with our approach here. And if we look at what's more interesting, if we look at the data delivery ratio, then the planned approach where we don't actually have collisions and so on, we effectively get perfect data collection. Uh, data collection. Whereas with the legacy and the delayed one, we can see that because of collisions and with an increased number of nodes, the data delivery ratio really goes down and becomes at some point, it becomes useless. I mean, we could, you know, in a way, we, we don't really collect data anymore. We end up having so many collisions when we try to, to capture all the data. So if you want this kind of bulk data transmission, you really have to use a, a time slotted, a carefully designed time slotted approach like what we, what we propose in this particular piece of work here. And if we look at 
The data collection time here, again, if we have the delayed uh, LoRa one transmission here, then we, we have a very large data collection time. So at this point here, about 500 minutes, for example, for this kind of, when we have 2000 nodes, again, 5.6 kilobytes and so on, you can see is, uh, that means that a drone would have to stay there for a significant amount of time. Whereas we can do this much quicker with the different approaches. So one approach here, uh, um, uh, the, the one, the red one with alpha equals one is optimized for data, tr uh, data collection. So this is quicker even than the one that's optimized for energy. Okay, so that's an example of where we uh, did some work to propose enhancements to LoRaWAN for bulk data transmission. So in remote areas, for example. Uh, then we did um, some work on using time slotted approaches and I'll skip over this only again, this was based on things that we learned um, when, we, when we looked at what happens when we use time slotting. And so this is another piece of work where we wanted to uh, use uh, time slotted LoRaWAN for industrial internet of things applications. And again, here, what we found is if we use time slotting, we can get much better performance. So again, the packet delivery ratio here is, is essentially perfect compared to when we have nodes increase the number of nodes where it drops down. And again, with the energy consumption here, we get improvements um, and so on. So again, the time slotted approaches are work very well, but you get uh, what, what, you, what you buy into here is time synchronization. And that time synchronization costs you some, um, some energy, uh, not a lot, but what is, is actually, what, what is, is a little bit, um, uh, well, if you, what can cause a lot of energy consumption is if you have a complicated reservation mechanism. And in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, there was a lot of work done around reservation-based ALOA protocols and so on. Um, uh, and a lot of them uh, have a complicated mechanism that can potentially cost a lot of energy. At the time, energy wasn't really a concern. Uh, researchers weren't looking at much uh, as much at it, whereas in, in the case of IoT battery power devices, this is much more important. So part of the work here was also for us to devise a very simple way of, uh, of allocating uh, time slots uh, in a self-organizing way. Um, so that's, that's kind of part of this work. Okay, so there's two more pieces of work coming. How are we doing with time at the moment? Um, I think you have at least time for one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe maybe one of the things that's interesting here is what we did, and this is something that's become quite interesting over the last three years, I would say, is can we use LoRa with satellite communications? So there's a lot of low Earth orbit satellites that are being deployed, and we know, for example, that um, that there is, um, you know, Elon Musk's company, for example, has uh, Starlink. They have a a, um, a low Earth orbit satellite system for um, for a satellite-based broadband internet access, for example, and so on. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of technology out there now for low Earth orbit, uh, small-scale satellites that could be used uh, for lots of applications. And so, for example, here you 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 could envisage that where you have very remote areas, you you could have this bulk data transmission that I mentioned based on drones, for example, is one approach. Or alternatively instead of bulk data transmission, you have real-time data transmissions based on satellites. And so this is a piece of work that we did with uh, folks from the collaborators from the Argentinian Space Agency. So the idea here is, and this is why this is the lower tip of South America here. Um, so the idea was we have a, a, a remote deployment of IoT devices, for example, let's say in the Amazon jungle, you know, wherever you might have them and you, you definitely don't have ability to deploy gateways to link them with with uh, you know internet connectivity and so on so you have to use some satellite based systems so so what happens can you use lora in this context for example so we've, we we looked at this and there's a, a few other publications around um, so what we wanted to devise here was again a transmission schedule that would be uh, would make this feasible you know so the idea here is we have a um, a system of a number of N satellites in low Earth orbit that um, fly over a particular areas. 
And when they fly over the area, so this is our deployment here, for example, and we have different ways of how the satellite, the satellite's orbit might pass over this deployment area, for example. Uh, and again here, you know, this is the way from the satellite to look at it, and it depends on, on how the flyover trajectory is. So we looked at different flyover trajectories, and that then means the distance between the node and the satellite, for example, changes during the pass over time. So for example, this is at an elevation of zero degrees uh, flyover. This is at a different elevation here and so on. So we looked at these different elevations. And again, then we have our different power settings here that I, um, the, the sorry, different spreading factors here that lead to different received power sensitivities, for example, that we had to uh, consider for the different spreading factors from seven to 12 again. So we looked at this. Uh, and we did lots of simulations to evaluate what would happen here. And so, again, what we're looking at here is an element of time synchronization, because otherwise this, uh, this becomes really problematic. So uh, during a flyover time window here, we define a number of um, transmission frames. And each transmission frame has a downlink piece and, an, and then another, an uplink piece. During the downlink piece, we tr the satellite transmits a beacon to allow the, the nodes to, to synchronize uh, to, the, to, the, um, um, to the satellite um, uh, timing. And that then allows uh, a more synchronized transmission during the uplink um, uh, period here. And so when we looked at, so what we looked at is, we looked at two aspects here. First of all, we looked at LoRa uh, legacy. So that's the standard LoRa transmission. And then there is a new LoRa enhancement version out there that has been defined by Semtech, which uses, um, uh, which, which uses mini packets and channel hopping. And unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go uh, on uh, to, to explain this in, in detail. But what it does is it, it makes it, it makes the transmission more robust. And so what we then looked at is, we looked at, if you look at LoRa legacy here, we looked at LoRa legacy conservative. So this is the traditional Aloha transmission. And then we looked at random transmissions where we, uh, where the, the nodes transmit at random rather than transmitting when they see, receive a beacon and when they get an opportunity to transmit, but spread this out at random over the, the uplink window. And then when we looked at also linking this with the trajectory. So for the nodes, the nodes uh, basically synchronizing their transmissions more to the trajectory so that when, the, when they're closest to the satellite uh, during the flyover period that they would transmit when, uh, when is the best opportunity to transmit so that you have the best, the, or the, the best received signal indicator. So we looked at this and then we again looked at the scalability. When we increase the node count, what does that mean in terms of the average extraction ratio or packet delivery ratio? And so you can see is depending on how you design your system, you get better performance. Now, what we did also, we compared this with a theoretical optimum where every node basically is uh, scheduled to transmit um, uh, at a particular optimum point in time with the optimum power and so on. Something you can't really do, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to have a sort of a, a, a potential upper bound in terms of performance. And so that that's it's is this this one up here, but that's only a theoretical limit that that typically cannot be achieved in reality. Although when we try to publish this, we had some trouble explaining this to some of the reviewers, um, what we meant by this. Um, and then we we looked at uh, again the average packet count here um, in terms of we wanted to understand the number of. Uh, packets that were sent, those that were extracted, those that were not processed, that collided or were lost. So we wanted to understand how all of these different approaches here, how they played around, um, how they how they impacted the different aspects of performance. You know, so how did this impact collisions, for example? So as you can see, is here, LoRa conservatives, very high collisions, random. You reduce the collisions. But as you can see is here, depending on how you work this out in trajectory and so on, the trajectory approaches and so on, you, you get different performance um, aspects. LoRa-E, this enhanced new physical layer 
has much better performance here. Okay, so if I, I don't know what time is it now. Yeah, so maybe maybe we'll stop here. I'll skip this last bit. This is a piece of work we did about um, now about five years ago on trying to use compression techniques to actually run a full IoT stack on LoRa end devices. So I'll skip over this, but as I said, there's a paper there that if you're interested, please have a look at it. We'll explain how we did that. So effectively, what what I um, what our work certainly indicates that that LoRa One is an attractive connectivity solution for the Internet of Things. It offers lots of flexibility because you you have you have lots of parameters you can play around with, but the standard Mac protocol has limitations in uh, in terms of uh, the the use cases that can be. Um, um, that 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 can be you uh, or the types of applications you can use with, but also in terms of uh, the, the the density of deployment has some fairness issues which we try to overcome, um, uh, and we showed that time slotted operation if you design this very carefully has lots of advantages. We also showed that LoRa can in fact also be used with satellite communications, which may be quite interesting. And there is a number of companies out there that are already looking at this. And I wouldn't be too surprised if in the next number of years we see some some real up uh, sat LoRa satellite based um, services becoming uh, available. So this is not uh, the work of a single person. So I'd like to acknowledge um, the the the, uh, the work and collaboration here with a number of uh, colleagues, former PhD students, international collaborators, and so on. Um, um, so this this is piece of uh, work of quite quite a significant group of people okay so that's it uh, from me wow. for today thanks very much for thank you your... this is uh, this was a lot of interesting information a lot of interesting papers i think we have uh, quite a longer reading list now all of us uh there are also some questions online which i think we can invest a couple of minutes for that um, sure yeah absolutely I, I i hope the stream is not finishing uh automatically we'll see how that goes so there are some questions, for example, about the time synchronization. Um, how often do you have to do that? Uh, is it a, just a one-time thing, or is it several times, or how often do you do it? Yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. I mean, the, <laughs> there is no the, there's no definite answer to this. I mean, you have to do time synchronization uh, often enough to make sure that you compensate for the time drift in end devices. And time drift depends on the quality of your crystals that you use. It mm -hmm. depends on the temperature very often, humidity and so on. So, so this is, um, so there's no, there's no clear answer. I mean, in most cases, most um, uh, IoT systems, for example, do time synchronization on a per frame basis. And a frame typically is not much longer than a number of seconds, certainly not, not more than a minute usually. Uh, so that's what you would do in order to be on the safe side. But you could probably do it, you know, sometimes you might be able to do it every half an hour. Or so if you have very, you know, very stable clocks uh, or crystals within each of the end devices. Yeah, every half an hour is already quite, uh, quite high, actually, yeah, quite, quite scary. Um, another question about that is that the precision you presented was actually quite good. Uh, so what kind of end user devices did you actually use there? Yeah, most of most of I must admit, most of the work is in uh, in computer simulation. Oh, um, I, I, I would have I would have liked to have a LoRa deployment with four thousand end devices, but to manage that, <laughs> to manage that, a the cost of that, unfortunately, um, funding agencies especially are never that time generous, cost, especially and, and, time and personal cost. Yeah, definitely. yeah, and to manage that is even. Yeah. I mean, you know, if an, anybody has ever done a large scale deployment, even with a hundred devices or so, to program all those devices, deploy them take all the data in the measurements and all of this, look after the devices, yeah. change the batteries. And so it's a huge effort. And so a lot of the studies in, uh, and a lot of the work as you've seen, um, focus on scalability. Yeah. That really works only in, a, in an effective way in computer simulation. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree with that. We have problems even when we have something like 20 devices, it's already a yeah. nightmare. 
yeah, uh, it's... half of them end up not working, not gathering data, not saving yeah. the data, whatever else happens. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a huge it's a huge effort, and yeah. unfortunately, it's we don't always get <laughs> we don't always get the resources to manage an effort like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there are also some other questions, if you don't mind. Um, there is uh, uh, one about uh, the drones, the drone work which you presented. Uh, is it the drone actually moving uh, while collecting the data or it's kind of stationary or? Yeah, again, again, this is is conceptual. I mean, what, wow. we, what, what we looked at here is you know, why would you, what would be a use case for bulk data transmission, for example? And so, uh, so the, the drone would be uh, one of the things. So what we, what we didn't, I don't think we looked at, we discussed this at one point, but I don't think uh, Khaled managed to look at this is we looked at what, what, you know, the influence of the, whether we, we want to um, optimize this or based on the drone trajectory, for example, I, Cannot, I'm not entirely sure whether we discussed it and he did some work on it or so. If you look at our paper, the paper is called Free. Let me go back to the... Yeah, I, um, I saw it in one of the slides, the Free. Yeah, it's one of the slides. If you look at the paper, it's called Free. Um, if, if you look at this, it, it details the work that, that we did there. Also, I'm very happy to email anybody Khaled's PhD thesis that has a more detail again in it, if somebody yeah. is really interested in this. I think we discussed we discussed the influence of the um, of the drone trajectory, okay. um, but I can't recall. Now I don't have any specific data at hand to to talk okay. about this, but but it is something that probably would need to be considered. Yeah. Okay, uh, and maybe last question from the audience. Uh, somebody is asking whether. Um, whether like all of the work you presented is highly interesting and it seems to be performing much better than legacy Laurel one. And so do you also uh, did or are doing some efforts to put that actually into the standard back? Yeah, no, we, we, we aren't really, I mean, we are academics and we, we haven't, I mean, this, this is, this is published work. So if, yeah. the, if, if they the want they can pick it up, yeah. yeah, if the Laura Alliance is interested in this, they are very welcome to to incorporate some of this into the yeah. standard. But we are not participating in 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 standards work. Now we are, we we did some work uh, together with a, an Irish company called the Nalto. Mm -hmm. They um, they offer uh, they they have Laura based services, um, and I'm unsure. Uh, Khaled worked for them for a while. He's moved on now to a different company. Um, I'm not sure whether they did some, whether they um, uh, are contributing to the standards. We did some work with them for over-the-air updates, for example, work that I haven't presented here today. But if you again, if you want mm. to interested in there, there's there's a paper on this uh, that we published a couple of years ago, uh, where we try to optimize uh, or look at at the best way of up updating uh, the LoRa firm the firmware in, in end devices over the air, for example. So I'm not sure whether the Nalto out of that work were contributing anything to standardization. I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I would say we end our discussion here at this point. Thank you very much, Dirk. It was very, very interesting. Um, and so to all of the audience, please, uh, of course, the video will be available uh, also online after the talk. You can repeat it anytime you would like. So share it, subscribe. Uh, and next time we will see each other on the 2nd of February together with Pietro Manzoni, who will be talking about um, AIoT for environmental intelligence, also a highly interesting application domain. And I'm looking also forward to his talk. So thank you very much, Dirk. And goodbye, okay, everyone. Michael. Sorry, my I think the, the room is getting dark here. My, yeah, it looks I'm, like I'm, dis I'm okay. disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe time thank to go you. also. Thank you very much.